Joining me this week is Andrea Samadhi. Andrea is an author and a teacher originally from Toronto, but now living in Arizona. She has spent the last 26 years working with social emotional learning, students, and education. She is the author of the book, Level Up, a brain-based strategy to skyrocket student success and achievement. And that book uses the latest research to help students increase their learning potential and access those aha moments that make learning memorable. In 2014, Andrea also created the program Level Up that consists of the book and over 60 online lessons and resources. And that was chosen by the Arizona Department of Education for a character and leadership grant to be used in Arizona schools. Andrea is also the host of the podcast, Neuroscience Meets Social Emotional Learning. And that podcast has been listed as one of the best SEL podcasts in 2021 and a top 30 best neuroscience podcast in 2022. Neuroscience and SEL is why I've invited Andrea here today in the podcast. So Andrea, welcome to the Tom Schumer podcast. Oh, thanks so much. That was a great intro. You sound like a sports <laughs> broadcaster or something, You're like all pumped up, ready to go. Well, I am fired up to, to talk to you because this connection between neuroscience, I appreciate that. Maybe we'll do some sports broadcasting sometime soon. Uh, the connection between neuroscience and SEL is one that has really intrigued me because I think sometimes we underestimate or we, we don't think enough about the connection to the brain and the way the brain develops. Um, so I'm glad you agreed to join me today. And I really want to dig into the whole idea of the connection between neuroscience and SEL. But before we do that, let's start, for those who don't know you, uh, let's start a little bit with your background, your resume. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about your career so far. Sure. Well, it started kind of where in Toronto, you know, I went to teacher's college and was hired by my middle school history teacher for my first teaching position. And, you know, you, you never forget those teachers that had their, their eye on you to kind of help you out along the way. And I thought, oh, this, this guy's great. He's hiring me for my first position. And he gave me this behavioral class that almost killed me. It was like, I thought I, I was barely going to survive day to day, week by week. It was me with these students and this buzzer on the wall. And, uh, and it, it was stressful and I didn't expect this uh, as a first year teacher. It just turned everything upside down. And, and this guy was actually a, in his spare time, he was a ref for the Canadian Football League. So he was one of those guys who didn't want to disappoint. And, you know, I thought I didn't quit anything. And if there was any of my friends that I asked, you know, is Andrea going to leave her career? Well, everyone would have said no chance. I, I stick through to the very end in everything that I do. But I broke my contract with the Toronto School District. And uh, it was where I went from there, it was actually, I had a neighbor who worked for a motivational speaker. And after my experience with the buzzer on the wall, I went to work for the speaker and try to infuse myself with positivity and learn some new strategies. And it was here that I saw this speaker working with these skills that we now know are called social emotional skills. But back then there were soft skills or like setting goals and um, having a better attitude, things like this that weren't taken seriously in the classroom. But I watched these 12 teens skyrocket their results. And I just couldn't let it go because I had this classroom of kids that I couldn't impact. And I watched this speaker that didn't have a teaching degree turn them around. And I thought, you know, there's something here to these skills that aren't taught in, this, in the classroom. And, you know, it was just at that moment that I thought this is what I'm meant to do. And I didn't feel bad about breaking my contract. And I went and worked with this speaker, traveled around the U.S., trying to find my place with where I fit here. And it was Columbine, when Columbine happened, that was the instigator for me to move from Toronto to the U.S. to see what else I could do. And it's it's been like a not a very simple path from, you know, teaching degree, quitting, figuring things out, saw SEL, thought this is it. And then I get to Arizona and then September 11th happens and it was brutal li living in a new country. I didn't even know where the mailboxes were. Like they're not like in Canada. I'm like calling my friends in Kentucky going, how do I mail a letter back, back to Toronto? I had no idea. Like all it's, moving to a new country, it's, it's di different. Yeah, for sure. Certainly. Yeah, the, so, uh, the similarities between the countries are, are are vast, but there are differences and nuances between how we live in Canada and the United States, for sure. So um, you're in the new country. Where do we go from there? So new country, wanting to make a difference. September 11th happens. 
bam, a, like upside down. And I actually was writing a book at the time. It was in my briefcase and I, I hadn't published it yet, but I had this great idea of what I was going to do for kids before like World Trade Center went down and all this chaos happened. And so from there, I ended up going to work for an educational publisher with these ideas in the back of my head. And I just couldn't let go of them. And I was always trying to infuse them into Pearson's products. Like I would meet with the product development team and say, we really should put these concepts. I don't know what they're called. Castle hadn't come up with their Castle 5 yet. There was no Castle website. It was just me saying to this product development team that had this product for high school students, we really should put these skills into the curriculum. And they're like, well, yeah, I don't know. I was ahead of the game always. It was... I was trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole kind of thing. And so I ended up, um, after I left Pearson, I thought I'm going to give this a shot. And I published my book and uh, presented to Arizona Department of Ed for a character leadership grant because there was only at the time one character program. Like if everyone remembers character counts, it was mm -hmm. like all across the US. And so I thought, well, I'm going to create a program, go in and add these SEL skills in. And uh, they chose my program, got in, got grant funding to go in. And it was at that moment that this educator said, I can't use your book. I need you to add neuroscience to this. And I'm thinking, what? Like I just you know, got the book published. And he said, you don't have to do this, but I would really like it if you did, because this is gonna be the future of education. So if you could get your head around how the brain works, we're gonna be onto something. And that's how I wrote Level Up. That was 2014. That went into the schools, got grant funding. And that's really where it all began with Neuroscience SEL. I've been trying to spearhead the um, credibility of neuroscience connected to SEL since that time. Right. You used the term um, soft skills earlier that we used to call them soft skills. And I don't know if it's just me, but I, I have this uh, visceral reaction to that term. I, I really loathe that term. Do you feel the same way about that? Because I feel like there's such a reductive kind of dismissive, um, uh, you know, dismissiveness to the idea of soft. There's a connotation there that I just cannot get my head around. And I, I really just bristle at that. Do you, do you feel the same way about that, that term well, soft skills? For sure, but I don't forget how difficult it was watching SEL get infused into the states. Like I watched the states create their um, their correlations to SEL from the beginning. I watched Castle start up, and it was difficult. Not everyone was on board because of this mindset. You know, they they weren't the the research hadn't paved its path yet. So now we go to Castle's website, we click on the research tab, we can see that these skills now show the 11 point academic gain for students. We know what it's done, but back then it, there, there was no research or at least it wasn't well known. And people right. still think they might have their own impression of what these skills are if they think that there's more validity to you know, the three R's, the reading, writing, arithmetic, rather than these skills. Right. It, it, it in, in some respects, understandable, but in other respects, kind of stunning that it took us until the 2000s to recognize that learning isn't just a clinical exercise and in acquiring information or knowledge, that there's a human being that does that learning and their emotional and social interactions are, are going to influence their ability to learn one way or the other. Okay, so as we've just been talking about, we, we've seen that SEL efforts over the last number of years have really been focused on you know, that well-being and that improved academic performance. And we've, we've you know, kind of documented that in, in your response. Those are definitely important outcomes. But as I think we want to go in the direction of the neuroscience here, because it goes deeper than that, doesn't it? The, the research seems to indicate that a focus on SEL and, and specifically self-regulation really can impact brain development and the way that our brains sort of evolve. So what specifically happens to the brain as students develop their self-regulatory habits and those default dispositions? Sure, so let's go back to when I was a teacher in the classroom with my behavioral students, like just use that as an example. Back then, no one knew that it was my cortisol increasing, that it was increasing theirs, causing the behavior. So when they were misbehaving, 
I didn't have these skills. I didn't, I wasn't using self-regulation breathing techniques myself. I was screaming back at them, sit down, Hu Sheng. I still remember their names because I yelled at them all the time, you know, like, and then I would turn around and try and teach something and then chalk brushes were flying. Like it was a nightmare and chaos. And it was all how I was handling it. Like I if you would have told me that, oh, it's all your fault. I would have said, no, what's wrong with these kids? and blame them, right? I had didn't have the, the understanding of what my own cortisol was doing. The research wasn't there, but now we know. And so, you know, we can just go back to that. Their brains weren't regulated. And I had behavioral students. I didn't know what happened to them before they got to school. They had really difficult lives. And I'm hearing as, as I'm interviewing people that we've got poverty, we, we've got abuse. And the pandemic magnified this as we went into kids' homes with cameras. There are things that I heard the teachers saw that were like heartbreaking that we didn't see when we're in the classroom because they can hide that and they can come into the classroom and you wonder why their buttons get pushed so quickly. It's because of the fact that every student has to be tr treated differently. They all have different brains. Their wires are brained differently. differently. And then, then I, I started to study Lori Desatel. She's starting to uh, train some of the educators in uh, Butler University Teacher College on understanding how the brain works. And she started quoting Dr. Bruce Perry in a lot of her work. And so I started to study her work and, you know, understanding that um, we've got to calm the students' brains down. So we're talking about self-regulation. Well, they're not going to suddenly calm down. When I was in the classroom with the students trying to work with my character program, I had a difficult uh, school, uh, a school that was high poverty, but they were there to learn and they wanted to learn what I was teaching them. It was just sometimes someone would say something and that the response of the teacher was usually get out, like get out, uh, Miss Samadhi's teaching get out of the classroom and then that wasn't the answer because then they miss what we're teaching and so we've got to teach these kids ways to regulate themselves which is not the usual reaction so we created like an amygdala for stage station in this high school class and the kids thought it was cool to step away and calm their brain it's just a different way of thinking about it like if you think back to 20 years ago no one ever asked you what brain strategies are you using I bet you, you didn't even connect the fact that you exercise to the fact that that's good for your brain. Like we just didn't have that knowledge. And then fast forward to the fact that Dr. Bruce Perry writes this book with Oprah, what happened to you? It's understanding that every kid's brain is gonna be different and they're all gonna respond differently. Some kids buttons might get pushed based on how you look at them or what you say to them or what perfume or cologne you're wearing you could trigger them to burst into a, a, a big uh, explosion in class based on something that you don't know because you don't know what happened to them. And it's all at the brain level. Right. The uh, listeners, you'll recall that uh, several months ago on the podcast, I, I used that same book, uh, Bruce Perry, Oprah Winfrey, to talk and, and sort of think aloud around what trauma-informed assessment practices might look like uh, in the classroom. And by no means do I consider myself an expert, but doing my own learning about that. Can we go back, though, Andrea, to something you said? Because I, I think some listeners might want some clarification on this. You said that, it, that in your history, you recognized that there, you said, I didn't realize it was all my fault. Now, you're not suggesting that students' misbehavior is all the responsibility of the teacher, that, that there is some, obviously the teacher is a massive influence on the context or the culture of the classroom, but where's that line? Where do you see that line? Because the students are human beings. They do make, they have their own brains. They make their own decisions, et cetera. So we're not suggest, I know you're not really suggesting that everything the students do wrong or misbehavior, that all, all that's the responsibility of the teacher, but how do, can you clarify that for me? Oh, definitely. And that's a good question, because that is something that I recognized from standing in front of the students and then going and looking back. I wouldn't have okay. thought that at the time. I would have thought, like, I've got this classroom and they gave me the, the worst choice of students. You know, the, Mr. Black had it out for me. I wouldn't have thought. But, but here's where it was. I know what I was doing. 
and I know I was boiling up inside. We know we only know what we're thinking. No one else would know. The guy standing next to me would think, oh, Andrea's really got her cool. But it was like my buttons were getting pushed from what the students were, were doing. My blood was boiling. We know when that happens. And I know that, that there's been research from Kimberly Schonert Reichel, actually in your state, in in, the, in your province, in um, British Columbia. She's uh, yep. she she's there. And she did a study to show that as the uh, educators' cortisol rises, so does the students, and it's like a never-ending cycle. Mm -hmm. And so it, that's where that came from. I know what I was thinking and doing. And there were days that the students were were great and well behaved. It was when I was more creative with my lesson plans, and I was really thinking out of the box. But then something would happen. I don't know. It could come out of the blue. One student would be off track, and then I didn't have the skills. I didn't have anything other than stop talking. Mm -hmm. go sit over there or like I did not have any of these strategies to include them and get past it um you know all, all these self-regulation strategies that we can teach them now it, so right. so I just know what I was doing and and for anyone else that's been in front of a difficult class you you only know what what's going on in your head no one else knows that right right for sure and and you know this idea of i've often thought of you know escalations of situations behavioral escalations etc like a like a tennis match where until somebody puts down the racket the 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 match is going to continue it's like you know sit in your seat and then they volley back to you and say no i don't want to do that and pretty soon you're back and forth and back and forth until one of us realizes there's certainly um i i would su subscribe to the assertion that the adult in the room has a disparate proportionate influence on the context and the behavior. I just wanted you to clarify that. I think yeah, it was important to, to get to that. So I'm also interested in hearing your perspective on this, because I think self-regulation is often talked about as this purposeful sort of conscious effortful kind of perspective that you just develop. Yet there is some research that I've read that says that that's only half the story, that our non-conscious, our automatic, our sort of, you know, bottom-up influences, things like genetics or stress hormones, et cetera. They also, and you touched on this, I th think a little bit when we talk about trauma, they also play a role in a person's ability to become more self-regulatory. So do you subscribe to what some researchers call this dual process model? Uh, and if so, what what is the approach that schools can take when supporting students? Should some of those non-conscious influences be negatively affecting a student's development of their self-regulatory skills? What do schools do in that situation when they recognize that some of those non-conscious influences are are maybe the source of the issue? Definitely. Like I think the biggest example for this would be um, the the whole Katrina situation because they studied the stress of the families after Katrina and uh, to see, you know, how did they, what happened to them after that happened? And they showed that the high level of stress put a lot of those families in a vulnerable situation. So when, when we're looking at our students, we don't know their situations, but we do know from the research that when like a, a bad situation like Katrina happens, students are more vulnerable and at risk for like they 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 follow these families and they track them there's higher levels of substance abuse and issues that that of that nature so they were not as resilient as the students that didn't have a situation like that so when we're looking at our students in the classroom it's it's not easy to know what situations have have happened and so take it like two people could have the same situation happen, like a car accident. One person walks away from the car accident completely fine. The other person goes into a complete depression. Why? Because their brains are wired differently from their life experiences. Mm -hmm. So that's how we have to look at our students. We don't know uh, how someone's going to react to a situation. We just have to now try to build resilient, safe classrooms that offer a predictable environment for our students to feel safe, to grow, and watch these uh, situations where they could feel vulnerable and be aware of what these situations could do for our students that, that come in from uh, unstable homes. Is that is that why often the approach is to say we should use we should utilize trauma informed practices with everyone because we simply don't know, and if we do take a trauma informed or you know a trauma sensitive approach to teaching to the way we interact with students, that the students had 
have not experienced trauma are no worse off, of course, but that the students who have experienced trauma are supported in almost as a default. Is that is that the rationale behind why that's often talked about as the way to approach schools? Well, that that's how I would do it because you okay. really don't know. And then there's the whole genetics epigenetics. We, mm -hmm. we don't know the family history and there's a lot of research showing what what's gone on with our grandparents and prior history can also cause our buttons to be pushed and have unconscious subconscious blocks in 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 our lives so all right. of this research it's it's fascinating as we can dig into it and so it would just make sense that we treat everyone with with some caution that um, we just don't know yeah we we certainly in canada talk a lot about the intergenerational effects of residential schools. You look at the the history in the United States, uh, uh, racial discrimination. You know uh, all that's gone on. You you I, I don't know that we can ever fully understand the impact it's had on on as you say on genetics in terms of development as 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 students move forward, grow from from childhood into adults, and then again, have their own families and how that impacts the way that they parent and how the school system interacts with them as well. And speaking of that, I think this is an important aspect because we can't, um, as the more I understand about the neuroscience and the connection of SEL or connection to SEL, the, the effects of those early disadvantages um, on shaping some of those self-regulation outcomes, whether it's neglect, it's poverty, it's trauma, um, there are those early experiences that schools just have no control over. So when, when we're talking about schools uh, supporting students, where's the line between understanding that some students come from that position of SEL disadvantage, if you will, and then schools using that as an excuse and I, and I hate to sound so harsh about this, but we often hear things like, well, look, what am I supposed to do? We, we get them when they're six years old, or we get them when they're in high school. Look, look at the background, look at the family. There's a line where we have to understand where they've come from and how they've grown up and what the environment was like, and then not using that as an excuse for why we've been ineffective or we've underachieved in terms of outcomes. How, how do you see that playing out in schools? Yeah, well, I saw it the most with Oprah when she wrote her book, What Happened to You with Dr. Perry, because right. she had such a difficult life. Like her parts in the book were like heartbreaking. I'm on the verge of tears reading her part. And then Bruce Perry comes in with the brain. And he said it was on purpose that he wrote the book this way. It was like an ebb and flow almost to soothe the person reading it. So get the shocking truth and then learn how to calm the brain with neuroscience, shocking truth, calm the brain. And when I was interviewing them, I thought, well, how on the earth did Oprah ever become so successful with, with such a short start to her life and all these experiences? But that's where I think these amazing teachers that see the best in everyone come in. It doesn't matter what your background is. We all have unlimited potential. If you fully believe that about every person, that they have this um, and, and it came out with one of my last interviews, it was all about this, the, the spirit of work, that we have this soul inside of us that's for expansion, and we're, we all have it, and we all have this tremendous power for greatness. And if you can look at every one of your students, no matter where they've come from, they could be the next Facebook creator or the next, you just don't know and you don't, it, what their background is, it doesn't matter because Oprah proved that she could get through uh, her difficult life. And I'm sure we could all come up with 30, 40, 50 different famous people like that. And then non-famous people. And so it would be just not limiting people based on their past, but seeing that we all have equal opportunity for success and incredible things in our life. Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to suggest that teachers do that extensively. I think that on occasion, you do hear individual teachers or schools or principals you kind of throw up their hands. But invariably, when you dig a little bit deeper on that, what I find is that the school or the, the principal or the teacher that's throwing up their hands and saying, what am I supposed to do, is really not putting any purposeful effort toward the development of those SEL competencies that schools that begin that purposeful effort or that intentionality around helping students develop those competencies, they never seem to be the ones that that 
leak into that idea of using it as an excuse. They just realize that the student needs more support. They need, they need to be surrounded with, with more attention, more care, more strategy, more fill in the blank of whatever that they need. So I think that's re really important um, to, to also clarify, because I don't want to suggest that schools do that a lot because they don't. Um, but sometimes it can, it can be that excuse or that um, kind of throwing up your hands and just saying, what are we supposed to do? Okay. So I want to finish up the conversation here with implementation and helping you know, the school community or stakeholders understand the importance of SEL in our schools. I think we touched on this early on, but I want to dig a little bit deeper because still today in 2022, as far as we have come, some groups of parents in some communities have, have again taken a stand against SEL uh, or anything SEL related or you know, any aspect of it, because they, they say it's all about the academics. It's all about reading, writing, arithmetic. We don't want to talk about relationships. That's not your job. All, all of those different aspects. So if you were advising a school principal or a superintendent, what are some ways that they can talk about SEL in a way that's accessible so that those hesitant groups of parents might understand more readily why this is important work for the schools to embark on? Sure. I always like to go back to a definition what it okay. is. Yeah. And the Aspen Institute defined it as every student having access to full and equal opportunity to succeed in life. And so you think about these skills, they're going to help them in school, college, career, and beyond. Mm -hmm. And then I would definitely always point them, just go look at the research from Castle's website that shows the 11-point academic gain. And then understanding what these skills are. I break it down into three parts. There's the social and interpersonal skills like navigating social situations, resolving conflicts, the emotional skills, managing your emotions, and then the academic and cognitive skills and show how they're all combined, mm -hmm. that, that, that you can't have one without the other. They all flow together. And, and I would remind them that, that this is not like, you know, imagining having kids just hold doors open and being courteous. There's so much more to the research that they're showing. And I would show them the reports and the research that's gone into it and how that it's, if you look at it, all state is getting involved because all state now, you know, they want to prevent car accidents for insurance for these kids. And they can show that kids that are studying these skills are less likely to have a car accident and die. And so, you know, that, th if you want to go that way, that these skills are life and death. They were teaching them skills that they're going to use now and forever to have a successful life in school and out of school. Yeah, I, I think that connection uh, is important. The research is important. I think the idea of connecting it, you know, not separating the silos of academic achievement and, and uh, social emotional competencies, but showing the connection between the two. Because I've often said, and listeners, you'll you know, have recalled longtime listeners have heard me say several times, I don't think it's Maslow before blooms. I think it's Maslow through blooms. It's, it's that academic link. Um, we've had several guests on the podcast talk about that. Okay. So let's last, last piece here. Let's best advice for teachers to ensure one of the concerns with any sort of effort is that we, we, we implement the light version, you know, the idea uh, that it becomes fluffy uh, and we don't really get to the, the important sort of substance piece, substantive pieces of it. So how do we as teachers ensure that our SEL efforts don't just de devolve into a fluffy experience and that, you know, something that feels good. We want substance. We want long-term impact. What are some of the things as a teacher that I should keep in mind as I think about helping my students develop these SEL competencies? Well, sure. We always want to go back to evidence-based, right? Like what's been proven to work. And that's the science. When we can connect the science to this, I think that's when we're going to get the results that are beyond the fluff. And anyone who starts to study the science of this, like uh, that's what I noticed with the podcast, that it becomes, you get uh, excited about what you're learning. When you're learning something new and then you're seeing it making an impact on yourself and your students, it, it, it starts to snowball. And I think that's where you get past the fluff. It's, there's no fluff involved when you're going into the brain. Like we're going into the science of it. There's no, there's no room for fluff. Mm -hmm. It's it got straight to understanding what the hippocampus is. How does the hippocampus impact memory? Well, what, 
how can we, um, what can we do that harms the hippocampus? Well, we don't get enough sleep. There, it's all science. And so when, and, and that's what this teacher was trying to get me to look at when he was saying, you need to add neuroscience to this. He just wanted me to go beyond where I was before, which I appreciate now looking back all these back then I was like, oh, you know, you, you don't like what I've done, but I can see what he wanted as a, a school administrator. He wanted to move past the fluff and give him something that he could use that, that we could prove. Yeah, I think it, it, as you said, mentioned earlier, it's beyond just opening doors and, and being courteous and, and respectful. That is important because rela relationship skills are important and part of the SEL competencies, but uh, it is more than that. And I think you're right. When you dig into the science, the brain development, you, you really can't go down the fluffy road with any of this work. Okay, two questions left as we finish up. These are questions I ask everyone who comes on the podcast. Really appreciate your time today, Andrea. This has been a fascinating conversation. Um, the first one, you can take this in any direction you want. It does not have to be about SEL. It can be about any, any topic you want. But the question is quite simple. Educationally speaking, what keeps you up at night? With kids at home in my house, it's school shootings. Yeah. It's you know, why I moved to the US in the first place when Columbine happened. Uh, we had just launched a program for kids with that speaker and we had made these pins um, to raise money and just raise awareness for kids and self-awareness. And I still have these pins in my desk and there was uh, Daryl Scott, the father of Rachel Scott. She was the first one that was killed in Columbine. And he was spe keynote speaking at this conference in Arizona. And I actually signed up to talk at one of the breakout sessions so I could meet him and say, you know, this is because of your story, he's got a program for kids in the schools. This is what I'm doing, trying to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just school shootings, kids, their future, we don't want that to ever happen again. That keeps me up for sure. Yeah, that would keep keep everyone up at night. It is interesting that um, you left Canada, came to the United States for that reason, when a lot of people would have gone in the other direction and uh, have left the United States and had, would have, if they had the option to move to Canada. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting and uh, this year level of commitment to, to addressing that issue. Okay, last question uh, is about success, personal success, professional success. Again, answer in any way that you want. But the question is simple. If a random person stopped you on the street and asked you, what is your definition of success? How would you answer them? Well, this digs back to my time working in the speaking industry because that was why people came to the seminars and why they paid thousands of dollars because success is a puzzle for most people. Like, you know, they just lack something and they, they're not sure what, what piece am I missing? And it was asked of, in, uh, this was asked of me in one of my job interviews. How do you define success? And so I go back to Earl Nightingale's definition. It's the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. So it's progressive. It takes time. You know, it's not going to, where you're going, where you are now and where you want to go, it's not happening overnight. It's progressive. And it's the realization. So it takes time worthy. It's got to be worthy of you because you're going to trade your life for it. I left Canada, my family to come here and struggle when, you know, the whole September 11th happened. I, I thought a couple of times, well, maybe I should go back and looked up my old department head. He always said he'd hire me back, but I just thought I've got to stick it through because this is a worthy goal. It's something that I want to keep doing. And then ideal, does it fit my identity of who I am? Something that I love, something that when times are are difficult and they did get difficult, am I going to stick it through and not give up? So it's progressive realization of a worthy ideal. And to me, that's your living success, no matter what you're doing. I think that is a fantastic definition of success and a fantastic way to close out today. Listeners, you can follow Andrea just about anywhere on Twitter and Instagram. The handle is at Andrea Samadhi. Uh, and Facebook and LinkedIn as well. Andrea's on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, also, Andrea Samadhi on YouTube. Uh, the website is www.achieveit360.com. Uh, and of course, the podcast that re really everyone should subscribe to is called Neuroscience Meets Social Emotional Learning. Well, I'll have, I'll have links for all of those uh, social media accounts, websites, and the podcast in the show notes. Andrea, thanks so much for your time today. This was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me, Tom. Thank you.